Mini episode 148 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by DOU Productions, delivering coverage of sports and pop culture through columns, live blogs, and original videos. Follow them on the web at generationshatter.blogspot.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. All right, welcome to Uh, obviously 1A and 1B for the uh, the parts leading up to this in this era. And I think by this point, SummerSlam was a firmly established event at this point. And yeah. people, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, the market, and you, you know, it's like, oh, are they going to do that SummerSlam? When, they, when 89 came around, oh, are they going to do that SummerSlam thing again? You know, yeah. you know, now it was obviously expected. It was, you know, it served its purpose. Okay, blow off your summer programs like we talked about at the beginning and, you know, try some other things. And, I think in the case of 91, what's more important, not just blow off the summer programs, but if you have summer programs that really aren't that exciting and that hot, you can tease what you're going to do in the fall, which yes. I think is much more critical when we talk about SummerSlam 1991 uh, from MSG, a show that's fondly remembered despite not having a ton of great in-ring work. It, it's it's very odd. And we talked Wait, with about exception, With there. one notable exception. Well, exactly. And... It, it was it was odd to me as a show that didn't seem to be very much of an end unto itself, but previewing the things to come. The first real mentions of Ric Flair on the show with the champion, the NWA championship belt from for Bobby Heenan. You had um, Sid Justice dipping his toe in the water of the WWF as the special referee uh, in the main event. Um, you, you had, for whatever reason, uh, The Undertaker not in a match with uh, Ultimate Warrior after starting a hot feud, but that was supposed to lead up to a fall uh, lineup. Uh, that they were going to be doing the body bag matches around the circuit here. You had all of these things that seemed to be pointing beyond SummerSlam, and that's the first thing I think of in 91 is that it just was, was, was odd. It didn't even seem to be a road bump between what was going on in the summer and in the fall, but a chance to basically push the fall house shows, which I thought was kind of weird. Well, when you look at the top, I think you needed some sizzle added because mm-hmm. they, this show was not a, you know, I'm like, it wouldn't be fair to call it a double main event in the sense that 1990 was a double main event like we talked about because it wasn't two matches, mm-hmm. but you had the match made in heaven and the match made in hell is what this was billed as, if you recall. Okay. And the match made in hell had very little intrigue. Even, right. You know, again, you know, I'm kind of a kid still at this point, 10, 11 years old when the show rolls around. No one bought the sergeant's, the sergeant's slaughter. It was tasteless like we talked about when it started. But even the tastelessness had kind of worn out by mm-hmm. August. You know, he lost the title to Hogan at WrestleMania seven. At this point, it was like, just just go away. It right. was kind of like a bad kind of heat. Right. You know, not that it was ever, you know, some, no, not that. It was the, the forerunner of X-Pac heat. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, no one should have really been patting themselves on the back for Slaughter drawing great heat early right. in that run. Right. But by this point, just no one cared. And no one, it was Hogan and the Warrior. And just to, again, you talk about, well, let's try to make there some intrigue. You have Hogan. The Warrior was not even, well, I guess he had lost the title to Slaughter and been wrong with him. I guess that was kind of his hook to get in here. Okay, but yeah. yeah. Hogan and the Warrior against Slaughter, Mustafa, and Adnan, mm-hmm. which was a dreadful heel side. Right. And then to, so they make it two on three in a desperate attempt for some intrigue. Sid Justice is brought in. What is he going to do as the referee? Mm-hmm. They tried playing up like, oh, he was spotted in the Slaughter locker room. It's a lot of desperate acts to basically mask that you had a very underwhelming main event. Right. I would argue that fourth year in a row, the final the, the final match at SummerSlam very underwhelming. Yeah. Four years under that. I mean, that's kind of odd. 
four years in a row to have a very underwhelming final match? Well, here, here's a funny thing, though. For, for as much as you weren't the world's biggest fan of Mega Powers, Mega Bucks, I take that main event over any of the next three. Certainly over 89. I would not even want to hear you tell me that a match with Zeus would be better than that one. 90 might be arguable, but I don't think 91's arguable. You wouldn't take Mega Powers, Mega Bucks. You, you wouldn't put it underneath any of the next three, I don't think. I wouldn't. Okay. You're right. You're right. And You're that, right. And, and that, that says it, something. It, it's funny, and as we're going to talk, they certainly you know, had a big change in philosophy yeah. headed into the next year. And, you know, this is kind of previewing ahead. And, you know, they, it, it, there's no doubt when you look at the first five Summer Slams, what last match everyone would take. Right. But, yeah, this was just very underwhelming. I mean, as a 10-year-old, you knew there was no chance to slow. I mean, granted, the WWE always sent the fans home happy in this era. But right. no one bought the heel side as winning. But it was more interesting, to your point, what was going on behind the scenes. Sid, it wound up being a very timely signing on the babyface side because the Ultimate Warrior was fired the day of the show. He held Vic McMahon up for money, apparently, mm -hmm. and they had him kind of run off into the sunset in the match. Right. You know, at the end of the match, he chases off Mustafa and Adnan Hogan, you know, goes clean over Slaughter. And, and, and yet Sid didn't and, have and any Sid, programs. I mean, he, no, he, he filled well, he the void, but he didn't he, have any he, programs. He, not right off the bat. No, right. I think, well, he, he kind of filled the void with Jake Roberts, who had freshly turned heel. Okay. Who, remember, Warrior was feuding with. Right. And Savage was going to, but Savage had to do the whole reinstatement angle. He was kind of a stopgap. Okay, Warrior's fired. Uh, we're going to move, you know, we'll talk about the match made in heaven in a second. We're going to do Savage Jake down the line, but we've got Jake who just did this red-hot heel turn. And by the way, I thought that was a great – I thought this was an unbelievable heel. Jake Roberts was excellent during this time period. Right. But what is he going to do? He's got to work against somebody. Well, we'll have him work against Sid. Um, it didn't really lead to any notable matches, obviously, and Lord knows it wouldn't have led to any classic matches. Right. But that's what Sid kind of did in the interim. But at the end of the show, it was you know him and Hogan – you know, po they were the two posing in the ring. The warrior was out of sight. So right. basically, the match made in hell, what it really accomplishes is Sid taking the ultimate warrior's place on the babyface side as 1B. Right. So. And, yeah, and you, the plan always apparently was for him to turn and wrestle Hogan. Yeah. Yeah, at some Although point. Although everyone always says that, oh, yeah, how do you not do Hogan Flair at WrestleMania? Apparently, the decision to not do that was made a lot sooner than a lot of people think. Well, part of it was, too, that, uh, and again, I've talked about it with you, that, you know, Flair comes in, kind of gets, in, in my estimation, made to be too much of just another guy. Yeah, and and, and those, that seems those, to be the mentality now, although he was very good. Yeah, but, but again, though, they didn't give him the outsider push that they should have, and it kind of fizzled and everything like that, and the house show matches just didn't, again, I'll always attribute that to them being half-hearted in pushing the match of the century uh, as opposed to anything else. I, I don't think Agreed. anything, anything can make Look, up for I'm that. Look, I'm not going to disagree with what you just said, but yeah. it's almost like calendar watch. You know, now you had four pay-per-views right. at this point in 91, firmly right. entrenched, and it's almost that when Flair debuted, it came at a point in the calendar year that that's tough to stretch to WrestleMania. They, they uh, started. Like with Flair Piper, they were starting to go that direction. And yeah. then at some point, they lost patience. Yeah, they did. It, a September, but any even, I mean, today, anytime. Yeah. It's tough. If you look back at the history of this company, there have been very few programs that they have stretched from September of the previous year of WrestleMania. Okay. The only one that comes to mind is Roddy Piper, Adrian Adonis. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. And that's when you, you could, uh, well. Name another one offhand. I'll well, put you on the spot. I know it that's not It fair. had an injury angle, which helped. But Steamboat Savage was a slow yeah, burn. Even that was November, though. Okay. That, but, but you're right. You slow could do burn. an injury angle. Yeah. But and, and they did that with both Piper and Adonis. They, they actually both took oh, turns doing right. injury angles. That's right. In, in that feud. But. Yeah, it, it's hard to do. But, but, but here's the thing, though. Like, For, forget about WrestleMania for a second because 91 was also the first year that they had a main event title match at, at, at Survivor Series, getting away from the exclusivity of Survivor Series matches at Survivor yeah, with Series. with Undertaker going over Hogan, yes. Yeah. So, okay, September to March or April, too long of a burn for Flair Hogan on pay-per-view. September to November, not exactly. 
You, you, you could have built a Flair Hogan at, at uh, Survivor Series 91. The mentality probably was, do you do that at Survivor Series? Now, I think you're right. In yeah. retrospect, okay, probably that would have been the right, right move. And you could, I mean, that's, that is a dreadful show from Detroit, right. Michigan. Okay, let me it tell was. you something. You think the auto industry or in Detroit, Michigan were, are in bad shape now. My God, I mean, the state of Joe Louis Arena, Thanksgiving Eve 91 wasn't exactly very good either. That was the match that uh, in Hulk Hogan's retelling happened 17 years beforehand. Hulk Ho- or the, uh, Undertaker uh, dropped him on his flat on his neck and broke every bone in his vertebrae and ever all that. You know, Hogan tells the story of that night and how, yeah, and how he convenient him. and he also conveniently leaves out how the crowd turned on him by the end of the match and popped for the Undertaker title win. I've yeah. never heard him say that. You don't you don't hear about that. But anyways, yeah, I mean the the, the main event of, of ninety one uh, Sur- Sur- uh, SummerSlam just just horrible, just beyond. It was just born, like no one. It was underwhelming. Um, fourth year in a well, I mean, like you said, the Mega Powers Mega Bucks was the most intriguing of the first four. SummerSlam main events, but again, to rehash this point that, hey, let's look forward, what's going the match made in heaven was actually the more talked about thing, and it, what seemed to be going in, just a throwaway kind of comedy WWE, it was the first wedding, it, it, it bombed with the live crowd, right. as you might imagine, hey, let's put a live wedding on at the end of a pay-per-view, that's real exciting, right? but... You know, Savage and Elizabeth, it's ironic that they wound up, you know, they had been married for years. They wound up getting divorced shortly after this. But the big angle coming out of this show was obviously Robert, Jake Roberts and The Undertaker. Uh, Roberts had freshly turned heel, siding with The Undertaker against The Ultimate Warrior. Warrior gets fired. What do these two do? Well, they always had wanted to obviously reinstate Savage and get him going. He had been retired by The Warrior at WrestleMania. They obviously wanted to get Savage back in the ring. He had a lot to give. And... They have him, that those two, Roberts, ruin the wedding. Sid came to his defense, if you remember. But that kicked off a red-hot fall. I thought this, the Savage Roberts program was hot. It I was. After, I mean, this Tuesday in Texas, Yeah, that match. Great that's pay-per-view a, name. That's, yeah, 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 really. I mean, Jesus. I mean, but that was a great – I remember I was really – everyone remembers the Cobra angle. Yeah. And, you know, they did the great – not to, be, not to be confused with the Cobra Roberts angle. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But they, yes, but they, you know, do the angle after where, you know, Roberts, you know, slaps Elizabeth. At yeah. This Tuesday. I mean, there was a lot of good stuff they got on that. But, again, this was more about hyping a much more star-studded fall lineup. I mean, yep. you had Flair coming in. Yep. You know, Heenan, you mentioned, they put the NWA belt on, which was a you know, holy crap moment. Right. He appears with the NWA title, presents it. Hogan, I don't even think he did this segment, that lazy SOB. Yeah. Like, they just show Heenan at the door saying, hey, you know, and this, they don't even show Hogan, like, walk. I mean, how gutless is Hulk Hogan and I participate in it? Yeah. yeah that, that was, <laughs> I mean, can he not even bother to show up? That, that was ridiculous. Uh, you know, the, the, the show was remembered for other things as well happening on uh, the undercard uh, in terms of great matches at 1804. The singles breakthrough for Bret Hart winning the Intercontinental Championship from an injured uh, Mr. Perfect uh, with uh, the coach of Cheers fame. No, actually, that's John Tolos who was uh, in his corner for that match. Uh, yeah, the co- you know, no one I don't think actually really remembers Mr. Perfect the coach months. You know, that was you know <laughs> Heenan. It's funny we can I can bleed this into an, another topic that I want to hit. The other highlight of this show besides this match. And by yeah. the way, one thing that I forget when watching this match is how over Brett was here. I mean, people really wanted th- th- this to be a title change. They got it. Of the first four Summer Slams, this is the best match, I think, pretty easily. Well, and, and I'm a Bret Hart fan, too, but let's give credit where credit's due. Oh, I- Some of that's the heel heat of Mr. Perfect. True, true. Yeah. And he and he had been a great champion, except for the yeah. cup of coffee that the Texas Tornado right. had in the fall of 90. He had been Intercontinental Champion for basically 15 months. Right. This was the end of that era for him. Yeah, and, and he has a back injury, goes on the shelf, one emerges of the great later on. Intercon- he, he, other than Randy Savage, his phenomenal Intercontinental title run that lasted basically the balance of 86 yeah. and then into early 87, there was no better Intercontinental Champion than Mr. Perfect, in oh. my opinion. Pedro Morales was way out there, but <laughs> I just knew I could get a <laughs> – ladies and gentlemen, the look at Kyle Ross's he face. Tr- I hate Pedro Morales. I don't care. <laughs> Even if you brought me statistical information that the man drew significant money, but I just don't like Pedro Morales. <laughs> am, am I just allowed to just – I'm ready like for someone? any kind of action, baby. <laughs> yeah. that's a, There's a great promo. Yeah. But, but with here, 
And it's funny. He obviously the reason you you referenced the coach Heenan was taken off the road. He had some neck injuries. He just you know originally they were going to put him with Ric Flair, but he's he, he was you he know, was out with him briefly, and he, then came off the road, and then that's when he, Perfect reemerged as the consultant. Yes, because the thing with Heenan is he had some legitimate neck injuries, and also he was very worried about going on the road with Ric Flair. Right. So which combination of the two. So he didn't want to do it, and that's why you know Perfect who had to semi-retire for a, a year and some change. Right. Was a good role to be the consultant of Ric Flair. But, yeah, this is a great match. But Bobby Heenan, mm-hmm. we need to bring this up. Okay, he's done as a man. He, uh, arguably, well, not arguably, he's easily, he's, in my opinion, one of the two greatest managers of all time with Jim Cornette. Mm-hmm. And this kind of goes into his second career starting this show. Now, he had been a commentator for a while right. in Wrestling Challenge with Mon- the Monsoon Heenan team was, was firmly entrenched by this point. But this is when he went full time. You know, he became the broadcast journalist, mm-hmm. and he really—I mean, no one is a big mark for commentary as I am on mm-hmm. these shows. Like, no one listens to the commentaries much. Like, the commentary on this show with Heenan, Piper, and I mean, Roman Soon's never going to wow anyone with this play-by-play, mm-hmm. but it was great. I love the commentary. I mean, Heenan and Piper are just blasting each other through the first two matches. Of this—I mean, I'll never forget. Heenan going to Piper and saying, "Oh, well, you know, Piper, I heard a rumor that your parents ran away from home when you were a kid. And, of course, Roddy Piper was an orphan, uh-huh. which is, oh. yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, they were just, cr- and, and, you know, and Piper's like, you know, Gorilla, I don't have to sit here and take this, do I? And Heenan's like, no, you can leave. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I just, I think that just needs to be noted with this show. It right. makes it very entertaining. The commentary on this show is really entertaining. Yeah. If, you listen, if, if you've watched it a couple times and you want to focus on something else the commentary is very good on this there's show. a couple things were memorable uh the bret hart title when i i actually this is the first one i think that i ever saw anywhere in public i saw this at the old harpos at the old location on brook park road in 91 they hadn't hadn't even been open that long the bret hart win was memorable to me and as somebody who grew up an nwa fan the legion of doom the hawk and animal the road warriors winning the tag team titles from the nasty boys becoming the only team to win nwa AWA and WWF tag team titles the Triple Crown. Yeah, and they, that was obviously not brought up then, but it was brought up in subsequent. When the LOD came back in 97, they did right, right when the NWA was no longer meaning a threat, anything. Yeah, yeah. They didn't and the AWA anything. was gone. Yeah, they, they brought it up, but um, that was underwhelming. That ta- Remember, it was a no DQ, no count out match, and the problem was is that era of WWF, they weren't going to do anything too crazy. Right. And it was such a formality that the LOD was, you know, the story of the LOD's career is always, they were the one team who never needed the belts. Yeah. You know, throughout history, when you look at the promotions, the most over team or the team that you want to focus on gets the belt. Right. The LOD never needed it because they always had the heat. Right. But, you know, they kind of waited and waited to put the belts on them here. You knew they were going to do it. And right. It's, again, kind of like a lot of, you know, like the main event, which I think, I can't remember if that actually had a no DQ gimmick built into it or not. They did some stuff with, like, the salt and the powder. I know, so maybe they mm. didn't want this overshadowing that. But I just remember this being really underwhelming. It's built like, on Wikipedia were, as being a street fight, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, no, I, I know this was built as no right. DQ or whatever. Right. But um, I, I can't remember if the main event was or not. Uh, the main event... It, was uh, I can't I, no just a straight handicap match. Okay, I, I know that they had some they had some gimmicks in there with some powder, but th- I thought right. the tag title match was way underwhelming. We should should point out by the way, with Bret Hart's title win, Intercontinental title changed hands each of the first four SummerSlams. That's now. true. Every SummerSlam they had changed That's hands. That's true. That was something to look forward to. Of the remaining things on this here, while the match in and of itself wasn't uh, memorable or, or any good, the post-match comedy, 938, Boss Man defeated the Mountie. Yeah, Jail seven hundred members. Yeah. Loser had to spend 24 hours in a New York City jail. The, the, the shot uh, at the end of all of that there, as the Mountie is left in a cell with a would-be jailhouse rapist, yeah, and the Mountie I, sells terror. Yeah, the, Great move. The Mountie definitely... Because yeah. after this, it was over. Yeah, you know, I mean, there was. I mean, that was it. Yeah, yeah. He really didn't. Do well, it. he got the cup of coffee with the IC I to think, lose yeah, it. Yeah, transition. He was lucky yeah. enough to b- yeah. be wrestling Bret Hart that night, but yeah, th- he earned himself additional paydays with his performance <laughs> after this. It was. It was kind of like a. I mean, it was. It's typical WWE of that era. You know, yeah. you have the American. You know, the the good moral cop against the corrupt Canadian. Which yeah. I mean, give me a break, but. <laughs> It, this was okay. The boss man was kind of at his height during this period. He had he had not gotten the Intercontinental title 
incidentally enough. I like the boss man in this program standing up for our American health care system against those commie single-payer types like the Mountie. But uh, that was great. <laughs> I knew I could get it. You know, by the way, I, you know, it's interesting. Apparently, there, there was a last minute decision not to use John Roberts as the special oh. guest referee here, okay? Because I understand I understand he would have turned heel and he gone with the Mountie. Yes, he would have yeah. gone with the Mountie. Yes. That's outstanding. He, he would have gone heel. Um, the, the, just the other things of note here. Um, oh, Virgil defeated Ted DiBiase for the million dollar championship. Three title changes on the show. Yeah, you know, this had this is one of those things that has. Oh, was, this is like the TNA Legends Championship. Well, is I, it a yeah, real belt? No, but okay. you know what? This was the height of the million dollar title, I think, yeah. and the height of Virgil certainly. Right. This was very well done. I think. I think this is a. I think this is the second best match because a lot of people would be. Everyone's going to pick Brett Perfect as match of the night. This is probably number two. I, I thought it was a good. It was a good idea for a feud. Now it's one of those things that after you do it, you know, Virgil, Virgil was was unmoored forever because that's all he was. Well, he was I, the put upon former butler of, of Ted DiBiase. He had no identity once the feud was done. Well, the, which is why I always, and no capacity for work right here. Yeah, why well, I, I always felt that Kane was in the same place and he stuck around <laughs> for all this time. I, by the way, Bobby Heenan gets away with uh, talking about his great commentary. He gets uh-huh. away with a joke in this match that never could be said on TV when it looks like Virgil's going to lose and he's like, oh, I hope Virgil didn't do something dumb and put a down payment on a boom box. <laughs> I swear to God, he says that's that amazing. Was, yes, and I mean, can you believe that? that? He would be fired like before the end of the show if he said that. That, that is downright amazing. Um, two other uh, throwaway matches that I just want to touch on briefly here. Um, one because of an angle that I discovered on YouTube that I didn't remember from at the time when the Natural Disasters defeated the Bushwhackers. I didn't realize oh, they were teasing a short-lived Andre the Giant comeback in the spring of 91. He was teasing, signing with the different managers, whatever, yeah. when he ended up not going with Jimmy Hart. Uh, that was when Earthquake attacked him, and it ended up being it a was, setup for this huge. Yeah, again, and this, this was just bad. I mean, anytime the Bushwhackers are involved in a pay-per-view uh, match, it's going to be bad. And also the big thing here too is the typhoon the former tugboat had turned on the bushwhackers in a six-man tag to yes. set this up it was okay it was tugboat and the bushwhackers against earthquake and the nasty boys okay on the cindy's and typhoon turned became tugboat they are the natural disasters but again this was more of a backdrop for what was to come because the lod yeah. comes out to kind of protect andre after the natural disasters do a glorified squash of the bushwhackers okay. to protect on to protect andre and, you know, this was basically as bad. I mean, you knew, going in, you knew this was going to be bad, and it was. It was. And we talk about the nice uh, six-man tags here. This one maybe not on a par with some of the previous ones, but Bulldog Steamboat Tornado against uh, Warlord and Power and Glory. Not you know, a bad use of those guys in a ten-man or a six-man tag. You know, six-mans like this are good use to open the show. I mean, this was kind of hot. You mm-hmm. had three either former or future intercontinental champions on the babyface side. And either the return or early in the return of Steamboat as the dragon. Very early. Mm-hmm. Now, let's not, of course, yeah, of course, he's a newcomer at this point. He's the dragon. We, 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 this uh, youngster. Yeah, this youngster. But I'm, I'm told this Ricky Steamboat fellow from Hawaii has a high upside. Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah, it was, but it, that was okay. I mean, it, I mean it, was, it was certainly no Tito and the Rockers versus Martel and no. the Rujos, but it was definitely better than King Duggan and Demolition versus Andre and the Twin Towers. Yeah. And Is this... Is this the best of the first four Summer Slams? Is this the best one? Do you like? I think it's pretty similar to '89 in that it's got a pretty good start, but it sputters towards the end. Just because, like, I would feel more warmly nostalgic towards '89. I kind of would too. Yeah, I mean, people fondly remember this show. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember it drew pretty good praise. Yeah, during the time period, but I think I liked '89 a little better too. Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, 92, uh, the last one in our mo- series here. Arguably the most famous SummerSlam. Uh, very possibly. It was. It, it had the biggest live attendance ever, 8355 in Wembley Stadium. But, according to the Melts, legitimately outdrew WrestleMania three. Yes. And it's one of these things where uh, I don't remember this in any of the promotion of it, and I'm struggling to come across it on Wikipedia now, but... You had uh, referenced in the production notes here this being called uh, the SummerSlam you thought you'd never see. It was. And, okay. What are you, are you I, calling I'm, me a liar? I'm just not seeing it anymore. Well, I okay. mean, I, 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 my, my, give... I, 
Oh, I'm sorry. My, my researcher evidently is failing me. <laughs> okay, here. no. Okay, so, let me tell you something. When it comes to when it comes to professional wrestling, okay, Kyle Ross greater than Wikipedia. Okay? Yes. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll give you that. Okay. They, they, that's that's what it was billed as, mm -hmm. and I think it's important to note here. I think the way we frame this show is the big thing. This was the first post Hogan pay per view. Hogan had faded in the sunset. Er, ran for his life from steroid charges. There would be a after cup of coffee 8. early the next year, but he'd be gone well before SummerSlam again. Yes. So, with no Hogan, they they were kind of. This was when Vince McMahon began to become open to actually trying new things. Mm -hmm. Something that is you know completely you know uh, void in today's WWE. Mm -hmm. So what they did is, if you remember, you know we talked about at the top. Not a lot of programs touched on in these early summer slams. Right. You know, there was just and here they basically just shuffled up what they were doing on the house shows. Right. And did a bunch of matches that there wasn't a lot of build to. If you remember that Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels was a big intercontinental title program, and, right. and I'm bringing that up right away because there were two rumored venues for yeah. the show. One is the one they obviously did it at, Wembley Stadium in England, which I think worked. And it, like I said, I think this is the most famous Summer Slam of all time. The other one they were going to do it in Washington, D.C. At the Cap Center? Where, I don't know. Okay. Uh, it, wherever probably the Bullets played at the time. I Land over Maryland Capital yeah, Center. Maybe, yeah, or maybe, I don't know if there was an, I, I'm not sure. But uh, true, true story. When I was interning there for a political organization the previous autumn, um, the I, fascists I, of America, I imagine. <laughs> or, uh, uh, I, I'll give a shout out to the Leadership Institute. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> I'm sure they're grateful to be mentioned on a wrestling uh, mini episode here. But anyways, <laughs> in going to a Rush concert the previous year, this was my first pr real encounter with any kind of, because you could go to the Cle in the late 80s in the Cleveland area, you go to concerts. There wasn't hardly security of any kind. It was anything goes. But in D.C., with all the gang stuff going on there and everything like that, it was the first time that ever, oh, you can't bring stuff in, whatever. I remember having to make a panicked run back to my car because I had, like, a bottle of schnapps on me. It was like, oh, God, they're frisking everybody. So it was one of those oh, things. A good share. Yeah, that good was share. Kind of a funny thing. And now making the easy segue to the proposed <laughs> ladder match between <laughs> Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting the way things worked out. Because obviously, when they went to, they made the decision to do this show in England. Mm -hmm. They needed a some English flavor, so to speak. And, and, and lo and behold, yeah, right there on the what do you know? They have Davy Boy Smith, and they did. They actually opened the curtain back a little bit, and they're like, yeah. "Hey, these guys are brother-in-laws." Yeah, which was an interesting. You know, that had never been touched on, but that was like the big selling point. And it was in England, the Bulldog. Can he win the Intercontinental Title in his home country? But to bring to take a few steps back before we go a few more forward. Had the show been in Washington, D.C., they were going to do Brett versus Sean, which was a program they were doing during mm -hmm. the summer anyway, and they were going to do the, they were actually going to have the ladder match on pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. uh, they had run some try. They had been doing, I don't know if they had done multiple. They had, I know done one. It's available on Smack 'em Whack 'em, the old Coliseum home video, a, a video title that could never be used today, I would imagine, at least in the wrestling uh, world. You sure that wasn't the one of uh, Sonny and the bikini shots? No, no, that, no. This is smack em, whack em, okay? <laughs> oh, okay? It's not a bad tape, by the way. Okay. Um, and you better put that Sonny and the yes. bikini shots. But right they were going to do the ladder match, and I think Sean, was, regardless, Brett was going to job. He was going to lose right. the intercount. So Sean could have, uh, the way it worked out, it didn't matter anyway. Sean beat the Bulldog anyway a couple months down the road. Um, but that's all water under the bridge. They do the Brett Bulldog. Yeah. And the inter in interestingly enough, I mean, it's not a big deal considering the Bulldog from England. Of course, now he'd probably job if it was if this was SummerSlam 2012. Yeah, but but a real hot shot kind of a deal. Bulldog wasn't even in a very prominent match at WrestleMania. It wasn't like he was being groomed. I don't even know if he was spot. on WrestleMania. I don't think he was on I WrestleMania. I think he was. I think he was. His match was actually, I believe. He was supposed to wrestle the Berserker, and that got bumped. Very possibly. But, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about a guy thrust into this thing that it's not like, okay, culminating it had not in been, like I said, well, yeah. yeah, it was the SummerSlam, you, you, again, that you never thought they did. A, it was a baby face versus baby face match. Yeah. And they were like, okay, well, he's in England. And it worked very well. I mean, make no mistake By the way, he it. wasn't on WrestleMania. I just looked it up. Yeah, he, I, I think his match was bumped. I think he was supposed to be on it, and he had a match bumped. Okay. I could be wrong. I remember he, he, he had some pay-per-view match, but it could have been Survivor Series after he was on the job squad. Okay. But 
you know, they bring, and it made a lot of sense to do that. The, it was cool. It's the best of the, of the first five Summer Slams. It's interesting that not everyone agrees on what I'm about to say because to me, I think it's not debatable. I, I it's th- the best match of the first five Summer, and still stands as one of the top Summer Slam matches of all time. Yeah, yeah I've I, got it in the top three or four. Twenty-five forty for the Intercontinental Title, and something again is something you would never see today. And the Intercontinental title in, in the main event of the show. And five for five Intercontinental it. title changes it, it, it in was. this podcast. But here's the thing. Here's why I think it's the SummerSlam you thought you'd never see. Because, again, I talk about this, and I'll, I'll go to my grave, and I know it's something Brett agrees with me on based on what he wrote in his book, that his push was way too abrupt. It, it was not that people were – it was too jarring when he ended up on top in the fall of 92. That there was not – because it was it was so jarring. But here's the thing, though. I will say in retrospect, if you look back, the one thing where Vince would have an argument to say in terms of building Brett up for this, Brett against Roddy Piper at WrestleMania, okay, that was a semi-main. That was a pretty important mm-hmm. match. This match closed SummerSlam in a way that there was a, it was a build towards that, but we didn't see it because here, here's why none of us saw it coming. And he Brett, carried both those matches, by the he, way. He did. Bret Hart is a pioneer because he's the first guy in the expansion era to get the WWF championship, who had had a ceiling on him at one point. Hulk Hogan came in with the mega push. Randy Savage came in with a real strong push. Even the Ultimate Warrior, when yeah. he started out, like you could see that, whatever. Brett was the first guy to break out of the pack. That, that he, yeah, he, he had just, been typecast. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. He's the first guy that had to he deal with that. He was a tag team wrestler. Right. And, and you look at this, and it's a thing where, but the tag teams, the tag teams of the 80s that were the breeding ground for some of the great singles workers of the 90s, this is why it's the SummerSlam you thought you'd never see, whether or not it's why they called it that. Because Bulldogs Heart Foundation, maybe the greatest tag team feud of the 80s, you go into 1992, and the prime movers from each tag team, uh, Billington was great, but his back was shot by this point, the prime movers closing SummerSlam in front of 80,000 people. It represented that progression, and for as much as we bitch about the glass ceiling, and yeah, you know, Brett through his career, even after he cracked it, got shoved back below it a few times here, this was one of the greatest breaking the glass ceiling moments in wrestling history. Well, yeah, it's the SummerSlam you thought you'd never see, and by the way, just to clarify, Tom yeah. Billington, you know him as the Dynamite Kid. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, okay, yeah. You said you'd work that <laughs> yeah, in yeah, somehow. Yeah, there we go. I, but continue, so yeah, I think that's this is a two match show. Yeah, this, I give this four and three quarters for those keeping score at home, and I know they all are. Yeah, uh, so that would be the top match, a quarter star above Brett Perfect, which I give four and a half. I'm old school. I don't, I'm not one of these people who's like, oh, you know, they they didn't do all these moves, these kickouts. You know, I don't, right. I, don't revi- I don't do revisionist history. That's for the hipsters, okay, who like to like claim that albums are no longer any good. You know, You're not going to give bonus points for lots of two counts. <coughs> Savage Steamboat. <coughs> That was a wonderful match. <laughs> was top WWF match of the year. You're an ass. <laughs> I just had to go there. The, the top <laughs> WWF match of the 80s. You could, you could listen to me demean Obamacare before you could listen to me demean Savage Steamboat. I'm convinced of that. Oh, that's absolutely true. <laughs> that's that's absolutely true. By but the way. This is if, a t- I'm sorry. Did I interrupt? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was, I, I was going to switch gears. <laughs> I was too, actually. Okay, this is a two-match show. I was going to the other one. Yeah. Okay, ironically, the other... Uh, very good matches. Another baby face versus baby face match. Keeping yeah. up with kind of the shuffling of things with Savage and the Warrior. Uh, you know, we got of, 28 minutes. No no Warrior match should ever get 28 minutes. Obviously, you haven't watched this match. I'll have, to, I'll have to rewatch it. This is a wonderful match. It's not as good as their classic at WrestleMania from the previous year uh-huh. because they go to a non-finish, first of all, and the heat wasn't as, as much there with the, with the career-ending angle. Right. But... This is unbelievable, and it's made great by, again, remember, th- th- this was done out of thin air, this match. They, the post-WrestleMania feud was Savage Flair, with because Savage had beaten Flair for the title yeah. at WrestleMania 8, and business had kind of tanked this time. You know, Sa- as great as he was as champion in 88, he, he was not very good in 92. Now, here's what I've heard, the Urban Legend. War, if you remember, there was a great angle here in this match with Mr. Perfect. When the, they signed the match, Flair was irate that he wasn't in the title match. Yep. So they did this thing with, oh, they were playing the two baby faces against each other, saying one of them is sold out and we'll have Mr. Perfect in his corner. And there was some distraction. I thought it was, a, it was wonderfully done. Mm-hmm. I've heard 
that the warrior was supposed to turn heel here and take the title. Yep. Okay. You I've saw heard that okay. too. Yeah. Now he balked. Big surprise there. Mm -hmm. And so they went with the fit, the non finish that they went with. With basically, you know, it was great because during that perfect tease that he was with both guys. Right. There was a lot of heat for this thing, by the way, too. This match. Right. This was a really. This is like a three and three quarter star match that had you, you know, I don't know that that. It, Believe it or not, I wasn't bored with the match either. Well, and they culminated it with 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 uh, Hannigan Flair attacking yeah. Savage's leg, setting up the title change yes, on TV which a couple was, days yeah, later. You, you, yeah, Warrior ends up coming into the aid of Savage, so the whole thing kind of goes full circle. Yeah, and then Warrior again winds up leaving the promotion because remember they were going to do the Mega Maniac. They were going to have Warrior and Savage team up right. at Survivor Series to take on Flair and Ramon, Razor Ramon had kind of made his mark coming in the promotion, ca helping cost Savage the title right. against Flair. Uh, but it turned out to be, and they, they turned Mr. Perfect babyface. But I thought this was wonderfully done, this match. Yeah, it, it was. It High was... marks. Not as good as WrestleMania, but this is one of three Ultimate Warrior matches that I would qualify as very good. And two involved Savage. Interesting. Yeah, and the other one was Rick Rude, which we yeah. talked about in uh, 1B of this podcast, the SummerSlam yeah. 89. Well, him, him at least being carryable sets him uh, above at least some people here. Um, in terms of uh, programs, again, we were starting to see more of programs, but not uh, blow-offs. Undertaker Kamala, a 3-minute, 27-second disqualification that was clearly just a road bump on the way to their coffin match at Survivor Series. This is an atrocious match. This is, it started out, this kind of began the really bad booking portion of The Undertaker. Yeah. Which is basically the first three years of him as a, ba four years of him as a baby face. Where he was just against a monster. Yeah. You know, Kamala, he was like scared of him. It was really bad. I don't know why they brought Kamala back in 1992. Yeah. No idea. No I idea. I mean, it did not. I mean, it was just bad. This, this match wouldn't shed any light on that. Although, uh, this again, is a really bad match, Ricky. It, I mean, this is a negative star affair. Okay, but at least they had one. Nails had to wrestle Virgil. As a by now complete JTTS stand in for the big boss man who was still selling the injuries there again nails and boss man that was to be settled at uh, that's I was at that Survivor yeah, Series so that's you that, that boy that was blow off central that night that that might have been the first pay per view of all time that was very blow off heavy and what's there funny, was the Tatanka Rick Martel blow off that night also too yes that was that, that whole night was well, like Rick blow Martel off. said Tatanka had some reservations about the match by <laughs> <Yeah>. the way <laughs> um, but. He, I see him working. Um, he, hey, he said it. I'm picking up what he's okay. putting down. <laughs> but, but yeah, what's funny with the nails thing is they actually wanted him to feel the Undertaker after losing that big blow off. That was very right. un, you know a couple years ago. They never would have had a guy lose that decisively if they were going to have him go to another big program. But right. yeah, nail. You're right. This was kind of like okay, nails is like the new mid card heel. They have him go up by Virgil, like selling it, like saying, "Oh, I got to tell the guys in the back, man, this nails for real." You know, I mean, <laughs> it was it was that was bad. But it was funny, Michaels, again, going with the SummerSlam you thought you'd never see. Yeah. Heel v. Heel. Heel versus heel. And this is kind of like a fun, like it was the no hitting in the face rule, him yeah. versus Rick Martel. Michaels was kind of displaced um, since he didn't get the Bret Hart match. And they, um, you know, so they do this. And I of don't want to be a smart mark, but I mean, they're both great workers. I would have liked to have seen a match with less goofy comedy. Well, that's because it was Rick Martel the model years. And right. every match Rick that was the where he That's was the true. model, sucked. Yeah. Rick Martel is the model. I cannot say this enough. Sucked in, in the ring. In, in, he in, never had one good match. When in he was the, the model. period of fill in the blank by day, wrestler by night, which was really really stupid, which lasted until like 1997 at least. Uh, so you had that going on. Here's the thing here. And again, no that, hitting in the face is kind of funny though. <laughs> yeah, but again, I, I the purist in me wanted to see a better match between them. And again, the purist in me. And and, and here's where again. You're probably going to tell me that I'm being a little bit anal retentive for, 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 for talking about this here. You're being anal retentive. Okay. You, you just saved yourself time because you were going to say this anyways. Um, Crush wrestled the Repo Man. Oh, there we go. Okay, why don't you tell me what my criticism is? If you what, know they so didn't well. bring up that these guys are former yes. tag team partners? Yes, it's the battle of demolition. Why did that not come up? Because they were two different gimmicks. That was the era you were in. What are you going to say? What's the joke? As an after mag reader, they were insulting my intelligence. I knew of their history. I knew that this this crush, you may know him as former tag team champion uh, Demolition Crush. 
Repo Man, you may know him as Smash, former tag team member of, of Devolution. They were insulting my intelligence, Kyle. Well, Ross. and I think a lot of people kind of knew that, and that's why this sucked. Okay. Or I hate the Repo Man was a disaster. It was. Gimmick. It was. It was a very heatless uh, kind of a uh, gimmick. He was. He was always like. He was always funny. Gorilla Monsoon, one of the great he subtle. Looked like a human raccoon in that thing. One of the subtle barriers of all time. Monsoon always killed the Repo Man. I yeah. mean, bad. I mean, he didn't like that gimmick. It was. It was a horrible. It was gimmick. from the bottom of the Pat Patterson idea barrel. I don't want to go to any the bottom of any barrels frequented by yeah, Pat yeah, Patterson. There you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. the, the the other things here and uh, you know just kind the of the Anderson uh, Cooper barrel. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, just and just a couple of throwaways, including a tag team title match. The Natural Disasters, the tag team champions, defeating the Beverly Brothers. The Face Natural Disasters. Uh, great move there. Yeah, they they had been. I'll tell you what. When they win the belts. Yeah. This might be on the infamous smack 'em, whack 'em tape as well. Mm-hmm. That the crowd went crazy. The one thing you got to say for mon- it, money, it, money Inc. had some heat to him. It, it it didn't seem piped in. It seemed like I mean, you know, you can always tell when it's piped in because you can see in the background the crowd's not really doing anything. The crowd was going pretty wild. For that I'm not going to say it was tight. It was piped in, but I'm going to say any heat is all property of Money Inc. I can almost guarantee yeah, it. It was that. a real cup of coffee they had with the belts. Yeah. Now, it was funny. The LOD was originally supposed to get the belts back here. Yep. But Hawk was leaving for Japan, and so they had done the ch- title change. They uh, beat Money Inc. It was a forgettable match, and it was the, it was the last ride of the, the LOD on their first WWF incarnation, which is the only incarnation they had that really mattered anyways. So... Yeah, 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 their second run wasn't yeah, nearly that, as good. And, that, and again, you know, sign of the times here, I think this is the first one we talked about where we touched on at least briefly all of the matches. This was the first year where most of the matches at least made sense on paper. Even if the demolition one didn't and should have, most of them were on here for a reason, and, 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 and this sort of marks the transitional point. And as we're wrapping up this first era well, of SummerSlam, it's indicative of that. Well, yeah, there's two things, and this is going to be very important when we go to the next, the, the 93 through 97 period. Yeah. What we see here in 92. Longer matches. Yeah. Less matches. And what does that say? Not as much depth down the card. That's the big difference. You can, I mean, you, Wait till we get to 93 to 95. <laughs> yeah, and, or 96 is when it really hits its nadir. And 97, I mean, trust me, baby. We'll, we'll wait. I mean, we'll leave that as a tease. 96, they were starting to import the old WCW talent, but, yeah, they hadn't fully integrated it no, yet. No, trust right. me. Wait till we talk. You're going you're gonna to say, wow, Kyle, I did not know how bad this company was in that show. They had, they had, this enough, time they had enough depth to put uh, Steve Austin on the free-for-all in 96. No, they had enough stupidity to put him on the <laughs> free-for-all. But the two should not be confused. Yes, yes, that's stupidity. That's not depth. Okay. All right, yeah, that, that's depth of insanity, maybe. Yeah. But, but, no, that's what you're getting here. It's like, okay. A different era, longer matches. There were no real long matches on the first four Summer Slams, no. except for Brett Perfect, which goes about twenty. But I mean, you saw you have two twenty-plus minute matches on this show, near thirty minutes, as a matter well, of this, fact. This card didn't have Hogan on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, which is obviously a big deal too yeah. to bring it full circle. But you're going to see that moving forward. Less matches, you know, better in ring, a lot less depth. Right. We'll see that. So, yeah, so that, that we, we've now worked our way through the entire first era of WrestleMania, 1998 to 1992. Kyle, I look forward to the, the nadir of WWF history in the next one here, 93 to 97. As always, Rick, it's been your pleasure. Yes, thank you. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.